So I'm Richard, I've lived in Yatton since 2008, member of Yatwag since 2009, um, and trustee probably one or two years after that. Just my background before I moved to Yatton, I used to work in horticulture, so I thought I knew a thing or two about the land and managing the land. I have to say, since I've been a member of Yatwag and a trustee, um, I've learned from a different viewpoint. So I'd like to think I could see from both viewpoints, um, but it does give me, I think I have quite a wide understanding. Um, and then for the last two or three years, maybe even four years, I've had the privilege of being vice chair of um, Yakwag and supporting Tony and the rest of the trustees in all the work that they do. Um, and this evening, I wanted to give a talk. So it's two years since the last AGM. And I just wanted to give a talk and we're calling it a window into Yakwag and its reserves. So I'm going to take you through a little journey around some of our reserves with some of the highlights of those two years. Now, some of that will be a bit of a personal perspective. So some of it's a bit personal to me and some of the highlights, someone else might pick a different highlight than I might, but it's very much my viewpoint on the things that have gone on over the last two years that kind of excite me and, you know, the reason for Yakweg to being, if you like, what, what we do and what justifies our existence, okay? So let's see if I can successfully share my screen. Any second now, I should be able. Yeah. Oh, oh that's one. Yeah. So can you see the app? Yeah, logo? that's good. Yes. So it worked. Yeah. So a window into Yakwag and its reserves. And normally, if I talk in front of people, which I don't do very often, I try to keep people quite involved. And it's harder, virtually. So, when we move from around the reserves, I'm going to ask you, virtually, to get yourself into mode and try and keep you awake and keep you sort of virtually active. Okay? So, all you need to do is have a bit of enthusiasm and, and keep up. Okay? So, we're going to start the journey in Newport. One of the first reserves that Yakwake, um bought, I think it was back in 2006. It's been cut as a hay meadow annually since that time. Um, quite a late hay cut to give the flowers a chance to seed and um, flower and seed, give the pollinators time to feed and then the seed ready for the next year. Um, over the years, the flower amounts have gradually increased. It's not been a straight increase depending on the weather each year. Sometimes there's been some ups and downs. But in 2019, there was an explosion. And my journey for 2019, my personal journey, is that that was a year that myself and my wife, we went off to the Alps, the French Alps, at the beginning of June, uh, middle of June, and we did some walking in the French Alps, and we saw some alpine wildflower meadows. And I was really blown away by those wildflower meadows. And we came home, and a week or two later, we went into Newcroft. And even before we got into Newcroft, walking down the track next to it, we could look out into the field and we could see, I think it's masses of tufted vetch. Now the bottom right hand picture is actually a smooth vetch. It's the best photo I've got of a vetch, but it was a tufted vetch causing masses just across from the track. And in the field where you can see my photo, the purple flower, that's knapweed. And in the foreground, you can see pepper saxif rage, which is another photo of that in the top right hand corner. But there was an explosion of colour that year. There was birds that were boil out there in yellow. There was this map with the tufted vetch and the purple saxif rage, which don't look the most colourful, but they're an indication of an old wildflower meadow. And over the years, we've been watching the numbers of these plants, and there weren't many. Originally, the first time I went out there, there was about 12 to 14, but a gradual increase. But in 2019, they did pop up further up in the field, and there was a quite an increase. So what's the significance? Why am I finding on about pepper saxif rage? So I'm going to jump across to the next slide and you'll see there's a picture of a horsefly and there's a picture of a horsefly, bottom right, a horsefly on a pepper saxif rage. So the story around the horsefly is that it was in 2015 that locally Kiki first photographed the horsefly um, but he wasn't entirely sure of what it was. Um, he didn't have time to follow that up at the time, but a few years later, come 2018, 
he thought he was looking back at photos and he decided he needed to go look at him again and see if he could identify this horse fly. And he went into study uh, to Yukon Reserve and she found this horse fly in enough numbers that she took myself and Tony out there a few days later. And they were on the thistle flowers, the big picture on the left, they were on the thistle flowers and there were literally hundreds of them. An attempt was made to identify them and Burke, Bristol Environmental Recording Centre, was notified and they were excited enough that the next year, so 2019, so back to within the last two years, a chap called Ray Barnett from Burke came out to have a look. And he, he took him out there almost a year to the day since we'd seen hundreds on the thistles. When they went out to the field, Higgy was really concerned. There was barely a thistle in the field, if any. So, were there going to be any horse fly? And after much rummaging around and searching, they found them on the pepper saxifrage. So, if we hadn't managed to fill the light and kept the pepper saxifrage going, would there have been the right nectar for the horse fly? So what's significant about the horse fly? Well, Ray Bonnet was able to identify it as a four-line horse fly, which is nationally rare. Rare enough that we actually got a write-up in, where was it? I've got this written down. It was written up in the British Journal of Entomology and Natural History. It was important enough fine for that. And the four-line horse fly is really generally something that is mostly recorded in the southeast of England, so of East Sussex and, and East and South. So it's a really unusual find in this part of the country. And like I said, it was exciting enough that they actually sent one of their experts out to have a look. So that's the excitement of Newcroft in the last couple of years. So it's time to move on to the next, to the next reserve. And as I said, I'm going to try and keep you virtually active so we're not going to move far, so you need to think about the horsefly, get yourself into the mind and the body of the horsefly, and you're going to dart from flower to flower, next one on the way, and you're just going to go about 250 metres west of north, and you're going to land in Footmead. <coughs> Footmead's also on Congresby Moor, they're both in Congresby Parish. Um, Footmead was bought by Yathway in 2007. It's also been cut as a wildflower meadow, as a wild hay meadow, and so treated exactly the same as Moonbrook, but of course, it's seven years behind. So, being that many years behind, obviously its development is less. In 2019, so we had a meeting with Mary Trump from that joined and we had a look at some of the reserves, and it was the main reason for the meeting was talking about future funding at the Aquay. Um, when the meeting was over, and I was, and we hadn't been in to Footmead, but I was walking down the strawberry line with her, I was walking to home, she was walking back to her car, and we talked about Footmead, and I talked about the explosion of the bird's foot trefoil, top right picture, the bird's foot trefoil in Footmead. And what Mary said was that that is absolutely normal, that as a, as a meadow is coming back to a more natural state, one of the first, if not the first flower, to start to come in and colonize is the bird's foot trefoil. So that's an indication that Footmead is hopefully following where Newcroft has led. Um, the picture on the left, I just put that in, I thought I was quite pleased with that photo, that was taken in, foot, in Footmead. Um, as far as I'm aware, they think they're common blue butterflies, I'm sure Tony would um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then the bottom right photo is yellow loose strife. It was in 2019, which was the first time we spotted yellow loose strike in the banks of the ditch in Footmead. Um, and again, who knows, maybe that flower had been there all the time, or maybe it's come in, or maybe it's just our management has allowed it to slide enough so that it becomes visible, and we know now that it's there. And now that we know it's there, we're keeping an eye on it, like when we do any ditch clearance or anything, we'll be focused on making sure we maintain that yellow loose strike. And I'll come back to yellow loose strike later, okay? Because there's going to be a significance and some of you I'm sure will know what that significance is going to be. So it's time to move on again. And one of the things that we have, um, 
what connects all of our hay meadows is several of them have barn owl boxes in them and they're all pretty much all visited by barn owls. So it's time and unfortunately the barn owl box on this pole in foot meters has fallen over. So it's time to get in your head that you're in your, bar, your barn owl and your box is falling over, you need to find a new home. So this time we're going to fly just under a kilometre, about 1,500 metres, slightly east of north. You're going to come over the um, rooftops of the village, probably over the top of my house, and you're going to come to Kenmore. Okay, so obviously in a minute I'm going to talk about Kenmore Orchard. But before I do that, I want to say that in the main field at Kenmore, which is grazed by cattle, this is the one of our fields, one of our fields that is not cut as a hay meadow, um, in 2019, the glacier, our request put the cattle out there much later. And there's what we call a blind ditch, it's a ditch that doesn't really go anywhere. And we went and had a look at it. And it's another place that we found yellow loose twice, which we hadn't seen it there before. We weren't aware of it. It may be that it's been there all the time, but previous years, well, there's two things. A, the cattle might have chewed it off. But B, the other thing is, when the cattle are out there, we tend not to go out there. So it may just be that we've not seen it. So again, yellow loose stripe. And again, I'll come back to that and talk about the significance later. But obviously, the highlight here is a Kenmore orchard. So why an orchard and why Kenmore? So just across the road, some of you will know, is the entrance to the Grange orchard. So last remnant of ancient orchard within the village. There may be others, in fact, I know of at least one other within the parish, but this is the, it's the last one within the village, and it is under threat, it's under constant threat from development. Um, so, and I've seen recently, Faith has shared with me a map, an old map of the village, and the extent of orchards around the village, including where some of our um, houses are now, places like Stowey Road, and, and even coming right in close to the high street, there were a huge number of orchards. The Atom was obviously clearly an apple village. It was part of our culture and it's a shame if it can't still be. But the benefits of wildlife. Well, first of all, I, I said that I used to work on the land, but I used to manage food and hop farms. And I know from a horticultural point of view, that all those fruit trees and the fruit bushes that are in the hedge as a, somebody who grows fruit, you think about sawflies, you think about cotley moths, you think about things like current clearings in the currents, and you think of all those things, and I used to think of them as pests. But what I've learned is they're actually wildlife. And those apple trees, because we've planted all different, everyone's different variety, have a very wide um, flowering period. So they're going to provide nectar, pollen over a very long period, and that's going to benefit those invertebrates. And if we benefit the invertebrates, we're obviously benefiting things that feed off the invertebrates, whether that be the bats or the birds. It's a not a very well known fact that the little owl was introduced into the UK because of its importance, because they eat invertebrates as part, quite a large part of their diet, so they were introduced into the areas with orchards as pest control. So we keep the orchards, we keep the little owl and so many other kinds of birds. Okay, so moving on, and it's time to move on to our next reserve. And this time, so I think the one thing that I think of, when I think of that side of the village, um, and it may be sort of outside of the village, but I know that we've got brown hairs that side of the village, and I know that they're close to Kenmore, and I know they're in the next place that we're going to. So right now, you're going to think about your, your, your hair, and you're going to run like a hare because we've got quite a long way to go. So we're going to go two kilometres northeast, and we're going to have to dodge and dive because we don't think a hare particularly, are not aware that it swims very well, so we're going to have to find the bridges, run like a hare, and get to Littlewood. So, what's happened in Littlewood in the last two years? Well, in fact, what's happened in Littlewood in the last probably nine months is that last summer, um, Yakwag was able to make contact 
with the North Somerset and Bristol fungus group. And they were able to come out in a COVID secure way, only have two or three of them at a time, um, and do fungus surveys in Littlewood. And they came out monthly, I think it was from July to December. And on, on those visits, they recorded over 120 species of fungus in our six acre wood. And they're confident that if they keep visiting, they're going to find more. And they are very impressed with our little wood. And they're, they're like I said, the North Sun, Staten and Bristol fungus group. And I think if we can impress these people, um, then, we can, then we can sort of hold our hands up and say, we've done a good job in there. Um, we've managed little wood, mostly non intervention. When trees die or fall over, we leave them pretty much as they are, unless they're sort of public safety or issues or issues for us. If we're going to walk through there, obviously we can't risk injuring ourselves. But mostly the dead and decaying wood stays right where it is. And that's one of the reasons that we've got so much fungus. So what we're going to do now, we're going to move on once more to a reserve where we're going to spend a little bit longer time. And again, it's quite a long a distance, it's about two kilometers. And so as where the time's knocking on and somebody's going to tell me I'm overrunning, we're going to have to run like a deer because there's deers all that side of the village as well. We're going to run like a deer so we can leap over the reeds and we can jump over the railway line and we can get to Stowey Reserve. Stowey Reserve, bought by Yak back in 2006, another one that is um, cut as a hay meadow. Um, some of you will have been in the open day in 2019. So um, you will have had a walk around, will have done some um, ring dipping, and you might have been lucky enough to find the beautiful plant, top right corner. And before 2019, we weren't aware of this plant in the field. Had it arrived again, or what was it previously there, but in such small numbers, we hadn't noticed it. The previous owners of Stowey, who'd also cut Stowey once a year as a hay, hay meadow, came to the open day and they don't, didn't remember seeing the bugle before either. There's two, now two large patches of it. Um, it's interesting for us because it's, a, as far as we're concerned, or as far as we're aware, it's a new arrival. Um, we'll be watching it to see what happens. And then bottom right hand corner, there's some meadow room. That's it when it hasn't long come up through the grass. Um, it'll come up in a creamy white flower. There is other examples of it in the area. There's some along Kenmore Road. Um, unfortunately, it often gets cut off before it um, comes into flower. Um, it's sort of locally rare, I believe. Um, there should be more of it, but obviously farm management practices don't all always allow these things to thrive. But it's appeared in Stowey Reserve, and again, we'll be watching it for developments. So why would we be watching specific plants to see what's going on? Well, the answer, is in the yellow loose strife. Because remember, we've talked about yellow loose strife in two other reserves. And for me, the star of the show, the most exciting thing I get, this is when I get the most excited, talk about anything to do with Yakwe, is when I talk about yellow loose strife bee. So this incredible little bee, and it really is quite small, it times its emergence to come out when the yellow loose strife comes into flower. And its main food source is the yellow loose dry flower, but it's also, what it does, it extracts oil from the yellow loose dry. And the reason for that is it makes its nest in a hole in the ground, normally on the bank of a ditch, but that may not be exclusive, not sure about that, but it's a wetland bee. It has to think about, or it doesn't think about, but it has to, um, has to have something in place. It can't have its nest flooded in the winter when, when it's overwintering. So when it makes its hole in the, in the soil, it lines it with the oil from the yellow loose strife before packing it with food and laying its egg for its grub to grow when it hatches. And it's very reliant, oh, I've gone one too many. It's very light, reliant on on the yellow loose dry flower. And so it's very exciting for us that it's in Stowey. Now, until about three or four years ago, none of us had even heard of the yellow loose dry bee. And it was only because 
of the pandemic and people having more time and Tony and Faith spending extra time in the reserve and searching and this was the year that, we, that they found the yellow loosestrife bee. The yellow loosestrife bee, again, mostly the colonies are in the east of England, um, Cambridgeshire, Fens, places like that, although I understand there is one colony or there is a colony in Shackwick Keith. Um, that's one of my photos, but again, what the way we identified this one was Tony found it, Hickey went out with his camera, Hickey took some photos, even better than mine there, um, good enough that it was able to be sent away and the confirmed um, identification was done from the photos. But we were really excited and it justifies the way we manage our field and it excites me that we've managed to give this space over and we've got this wonderful little bee on our reserve. So there's one more, and I'll, by clicking on the screen at the wrong moment, I've given away where we're going next. We've got one last journey to go to. And so we're going to go, um, we're going to head just over two kilometres southeast first, because we're going to go into the one last creature that is really um, linked to Yakwag is the greatest horseshoe bat. So they link, you know, they're in all of our reserves, I'm pretty sure of that and we're going a long distance so I'm going to suggest we get into a head of a bat and we fly about two and a half kilometers southeast we're going to be into um, Kingswood and then we can maybe rest up in one of the um, mines in our hibernation um, in our roost and then we can turn half a kilometer southwest and we can come to Cobthorn. So Cobthorn Way, Congressbury, not a yak wake reserve yet but it soon will be, hopefully sometime this year. It's all to do with mitigation for housing development. So what you can't see on this photo, it's just around the corner, is where new houses were built. But one of the um, things that was put in place when um, that, well, the planning permission was given was that it needed to be mitigation for bats. So um, this piece of land, hopefully, like I say, later this year, will come into Yakwag um, ownership and we'll be managing that for bats, which we need, will need to be grazed by cattle. Um, where there's cattle, there's dung, where there's dung, there's dung beetles, and where there's dung beetles, there's greater horseshoe bats. So, but what my hope is that it will be grazed lightly enough that we can see what plants develop too. So I've talked about yellow loose dry, I've talked about pepper saxifrage, I've talked about all those things and the links they provide with the invertebrates and then the links to the invertebrate provide with something else. But it all starts from giving the space and the time for the things to grow and develop and starting from the bottom up. So that's my hope for Cobthorn, although of course, the main reason for it is the back mitigation. So that's, like I say, that, and that's where I'm gonna end going around the reserves. I'm gonna ask Julie to take the screen share away so you can see me again and I can see if you're all asleep. No, Julie. Yep, so you can see me now, hopefully. So when I started, Ooh. when I started, I talked about, the talk was going to be about Yakway and its reserves. So what about Yakway? And I must admit, I thought for a minute, Tony was going to steal my thunder earlier on when he started talking um, about sort of trustees and so on. But he, but he stopped at the right moment, so I'm all right. I can carry on. So, so what makes what makes Yakway work, and what gives that space? What gives it? What makes it happen so that those things can go on in our reserves? Well, it all comes down to the people, and whether that's members, trustees, volunteers, whatever, it all comes down to the people. So, the, what do the people do? You know, how do they make it happen? So, I just thought I wanted to, because some of you are new members, some of you've been around a long time. I wonder if anyone's ever really had that explained to them. So let's start with the trustees. So we've got the chair. Obviously, that's Tony. Don't mind. I'm sure Tony doesn't mind me naming him. Obviously, Tony's the figurehead. Tony's the, the drive, the ambition. Tony's a founding member of Court with Faith. But, and Tony's like, like I say, the figurehead. He talks to the councils. He comes up with the plans. He comes up with the ideas. And of course, he chairs the meetings. Yeah? But, so that's the 
the chair. And then obviously we've got the secretary, that's been winged, but it's going to be Chris, all the communication with the members, looking after the YAKWAG email address, keeping the minutes of the meeting, all the things that you'd expect a secretary to do. You've got the treasurer looking after the bank accounts, making sure the money's safe, making sure that the numbers add up, that the money's where it should be. Then we've got other, we've got other trustees. We've got one trustee who looks after things like policies. Obviously, we have to have health and safety policies. If one of us goes into a reserve on our own, we have loan working policies. We've got safeguarding policies. We've got policies for, for things that I'm not even sure what the policies are. Um, that's not my speciality, but we've got someone who's passionate about looking after policies. We've got someone on the committee who's into an ex-teacher who is our link, often our link with the schools, passionate about keeping up with education. And we've got a new um, trustee coming on board who's equally keen on education. Then we've got, we've got, and I might be missing a few out here, I'm doing this as I go along, we've got a few key volunteers. So we've got somebody who built and looks after the website. We've got um, a new volunteer, someone who's been taking um, overhead videos with a um, drone of some of our reserves. Some of you might have seen that on our um, Facebook page. We've got new volunteers that have come along and getting us on Twitter and Instagram. We've got people contributing to newsletters. And we've got those of us, there are four of us on the Land Management Committee who spend who is a privileged position, who spend time in the reserves. Um, so it's privileged because we spend more time in the reserves than anyone else. But it's also a responsible position because we need to um, make the decisions when to clear a ditch, if to cut a tree, if not to cut a tree, and those kinds of things. But what you might notice is, I haven't mentioned any of us being experts in wildlife. You know, some, some are, at the jet varying levels. I certainly know a lot more than I used to, but I don't consider myself an expert. And when I, when I thought of this talk and the ideas of it, was before we'd had some of these new um, members come along. So what I want to, what the point of the talk was, and it's still the point of the talk, is to say that if there's anyone out there that wants to contribute, but feels like they're not enough into wildlife, don't worry. We didn't know we needed somebody to look after Twitter or Instagram until they come along and volunteered to do it. We don't know what we need next until someone comes along and volunteers. So if there's anyone out there that wants to get more involved, or anyone out there who knows someone else who might want to get involved, but doesn't know how, it won't just be that you want to learn something, and once you've learned, then you'll be able to get more involved. But what the experience of the last few weeks of when we've had some new volunteers come on board and some key volunteers has shown us, it's shown us, it's shown again, that Yakwag is an open door, just to work as it was, in 2008, 2008, 9, when I joined, and within a year or so I was a trustee, Yakwag is an open door. So if there's anyone out there who wants to get involved, get in touch with Yakwag email address, the Facebook page, however you want. And I think that's where I can end. Or, but of course, any questions? I'll skip. Any questions? <laughs> no? Have I sent you all to sleep? Well, I was going to ask you one, Richard. Yes? Did you enjoy giving a talk about that? I did, yeah. I'd tell you what, you said to me about 30 minutes, and I'll tell you what, I think I nailed it. Well, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I think I nailed it. Yeah, I did. I did, but it makes me excited. <laughs> yeah, it makes me excited when I talk about some of these things, about, you know, some things which are, which can on the surface look quite small, but actually they're massive. You know, yeah. things like the horsefly, things quite like the yellow loose might be, where would they be without that way? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Is there something in the chat? Let's have a look. Yeah. Yeah, lots of comments coming in. Lots of comments. Yeah. I think I'm very appreciative. Yeah. <laughs> okay. certainly no am. questions. No questions. Any questions, someone speak up. <laughs> Can I ask a question? 
Um, yeah. You talked about uh, some of the older uh, reserves and the, the state the meadows had got into. Do they get to a stable position where they're not developing anymore? They're just being, uh, you know, just doing the same thing year in, year out? They haven't done yet. Right. They may do, but they haven't done yet. Right. Have you done any research to see whether, you know, in traditional hay meadows, whether that happens and how long it takes to happen? I don't Can think I we have. Oh, Katie wants to speak. Well, I was just going to say, when we first got Newcroft and uh, we went to the Somerset Record Office, because it was being grazed by cattle when we, when we bought the field, and we went to the Somerset Record Office and we found out that croft means enclosure mm -hmm. and we understood that the the that field had been enclosed from the moor it was a big common area and that that field had been excluded way back it was an early enclosure nothing to do with the later enclosure act but it went right back to the 1600s oh. as a hay meadow and we decided we would manage it for hay, we would just manage it by cutting, more by luck than anything else. Um, but the Natural England um, representative then, who, who was advising us, said it would take a hundred years to return it to a meadow. Wow, wow. gosh. Um, which is why it is very exciting for us mm. when we've only put in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and nature's rewarded us so well. And I think, you know, if people are still looking at that field in the same way, uh, you know, in another 80 years, uh, who knows what's going to be there? Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Well, thanks for the question. All right. Any others? Any other questions? Yeah. Richard? Trevor, Trevor Riddle. Just, go on, just, Trevor. just to say that the year before. Yakwa purchased Newcroft. It was one of their traditional wet winters, and there were 250 black headed gulls on a lake on Newcroft. <laughs> and Yakwa yeah. didn't graze it, and it's never flooded since. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting uh, you said that, Trevor, because I remember a, a local farmer, I won't mention their name, <laughs> saying that the, the, the ground had been uh, pounded so much um, that uh, that was the reason why it was, why it was flooding. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that's good. Mm. Yeah, uh, thank you, Trevor. That's good. Um, any other reflections? Um, I, I could say we would. We've last year we gave a special report on uh, Newcroft. Um, we we've come to appreciate it is a very. It's not a big area. It's very. We would love to take everybody in to the field and let them see. But uh, as soon as we do that, it, it destroys what we're looking at. We gave a special report, Faith did a special report last year. What we're hoping to do this coming year is maybe do some virtual tours, um, to take one of ourselves into the field and um, with a video, show you closely some of, some of the flowers. And uh, obviously report on what progress. Uh, and give the question that was asked just before, uh, a little while ago. Um, every year will be different, um, but what we do believe um, is that we've hit a sort of a tipping point. And, and that is very important because we uh, fortunately have seen something tipping um, in the right direction. But the worrying thing is, uh, with nature, things can tip in the other direction as well. And we don't really know with our local wildlife what the state is with some of the species. But we are pleased and we, we, we want a message of hope that what our fields are showing, these little beacons that we have, bits of heritage that we are a legacy we want to carry on with, um, they are shining bright at the moment and they're 
they're tipping in the right direction. So that is really good news. And um, I'm really grateful for your talk, Richard. It's good to hear uh, what you felt about it. And um, well, the real challenge is Cobthorn. Um, and see what difference we can make to the grass and there. So uh, watch this space. <laughs> right, so um, anything else anybody would like to say? Anything at all? It's a nice time to, good time to say anything. Would you all like to depart now? <laughs> <laughs> or not? We, we could talk for ages, so we're not going to, we're going to stop now, stop now, I think. Um, and thank you again, Richard. That was really good to have that report. We'll have some more of that. And do let us have your ideas. Uh, I know sometimes in a meeting, people don't like to say things, but uh, do talk to trustees. Um, just send a little email saying that was good. Do give encouragement to other volunteers. If you, you know, it's good to say thank you very much. Enjoyed that. I'd like more of this or that and the other. And we'll see what we can do. Mm -hmm.